really thrilled to have Ken Taylor from Training Industry join us today, uh, being able to share uh, recent and, and actually yet to be published even uh, insights on, on the industry, some of the surveys that, that Training Industry does, uh, and be able to talk about what's changing, what's the same, uh, and how we can apply that going forward. But Ken, maybe just to kick us off, you could just say a little bit about yourself uh, and about Training Industry. Sure. Well, I'm the CEO at Training Industry, and um, I've been here for roughly 16 of the company's 17 years. Um, we uh, are a resource made available to you to help you understand what's going on in corporate training. Um, and uh, we participate in a substantial amount of research of, of the audience uh, that makes up tra training industries visitors. We get roughly 300,000 uh, training related visitors a month who come to the website to consume the content, go to the webinars and uh, read all the uh, available information and infographics that we uh, that we collect and build based on our understanding of the corporate training market. Yeah, it's outstanding. And, and I think as we talk about the research that that's saying, there's a pretty good sample size. And I know you get, you know, different different numbers of respondents, but it's a real pulse of the industry and it's a, a real cross section. So we're excited to dive into some of those details. Um, I'll just say hello. I'm Ray Mackle. I'm a, a partner and managing director here at Sales Readiness Group. Uh, I also have the opportunity to deliver and oversee our, our facilitation team on a number of strategic client uh, engagements, as well as our collaborative learning experience uh, platform that we're going to talk a little bit more about today. But I uh, appreciate everybody joining. It, it is a great global audience. Uh, so thanks for participating. Uh, we will make the slides available uh, as part of the recording after the session, because I know that question comes up. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and jump in. And Ken, I know this is an area that you've looked at, but I don't want to you know, give away any of the answers here. What we'd love to do is just start off by engaging our audience. And again, this is anonymous, but what we'd like to understand is, you know, what's the likely change in your company's overall sales training budget uh, for this year. So assuming that you know budgets are more or less nailed down um, and uh, you know whether you're on a fiscal year or you have a, a or a calendar year or a different fiscal year, just looking at that budget going forward, love to hear you know from the audience what that's looking like. And Ken, maybe you can share a little bit uh, you know your your thoughts and and kind of what you've seen as a trend in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, our most recent research uh, that was pulled. Uh, uh, in the month of December, showed that most organizations are anticipating a uh, between five and ten percent increase uh, in the investment they're making uh, in training for employees in general, uh, and it was higher than that actually in the sales training domain. Um, we saw uh, relatively few companies expecting significant declines, and that was even in the face of uh, of, of known layoffs that were coming. So. So still pretty encouraging to see that organizations are seeing the connection between employee performance and providing great training. No, that's great. And, you know, it's interesting. It, it seems like we have a good cross section here. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. I think the numbers have, have stopped moving around uh, and I'm going to share the results. So if I'm looking at this and doing the math quickly, it looks like, uh, and is everybody seeing the results now? Yep. If I look at those who are increasing their spend this year, that looks like about 37% uh, if we look at increasing by 5, 10, or 20%. And what's really interesting, you know, 14% is increasing by 10% or more. Uh, so I think that that's exciting as well. About 44%, you know, staying neutral and 12% uh, have budgets shrinking. But, you know, I think in the days of, of doom and gloom and we're, you know, all trying to look at our crystal balls and see what the economy, what inflation, what recession is doing. But in the same time, I think people are appreciating that they need to invest in their people that they have. And in this, you know, times of do more with less, being able to increase their sales performance, being able to make them more effective or help them be more effective through better selling skills and better sales coaching. I think that that's really resonating. And that's what we're seeing here. Any other thoughts, you know, now seeing the results from the survey? Yeah, this is very consistent with what we've seen. Um, organizations are realizing that you can you can make investing in this kind of training a competitive advantage. Um, so even though companies may be cutting cost or cutting um, other expenses in the HR domain, like recruiting and, and some of those types of costs, they are trying to, to wherever possible, protect this investment. And we're going to talk later on in this, this discussion a little bit about why. 
um, when we learn at the learn the relationship between training and other uh, well-being measures of employees. That's great. Well, uh, good to capture that. We'll probably have a blog coming out about uh, some of the the results from from today's session as well. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and close that and keep us moving here. Um, let's talk about the agenda, kind of where we're headed. So uh, pretty simple, but I think a great backdrop for our discussion, um, which is, you know, why is sales training critical this year uh, to our success? And I say we as, you know, kind of the global uh, sales uh, sales and sales enablement uh, practitioners and, and professionals. Um, so we'll talk about, you know, what's important about that. Uh, Ken, I think, you know, sharing and, and diving into some of your research about what learners want and what's most effective. And I think those are two different conversations. And so uh, be really interested in talking about that. And then if we're able to address a preferred training method, what's the impact? What does that mean to the success of the training? And then ultimately, we'd like to share some examples of you know, how this is coming together in real life based on some of the experiences we've had. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in because I think this will be a, a really good discussion. Um, you know, in terms of sales training and the need for it, we saw if training budgets are increasing. You know, we're, we're this theme of do more with less is is pretty uh, widespread. You know, people are trying to understand how they do that. We have layoffs. Maybe the staff is being reduced. Um, you know, there's this great reset going on uh, and shuffling of of salespeople. But at the same time, we're still expected to grow sales. So if you're a chief revenue officer or, or VP of sales you're thinking, well, how do we continue to increase our top line? And, you know, what can we do to be more effective? Technology is one, but also skill development and training and coaching uh, is another. So, you know, we believe improving skills and our research actually with training industry supports that uh, better skills equals better results. So if we can improve their skills, uh, we see a strong correlation to sales performance. And, you know, even this idea of selling against the status quo and I think that's a that's an interesting one where oftentimes today we're competing with, are they going to do anything or are they going to wait and see? And I think better selling skills can help us articulate that business case, can help us quantify the cost of inaction, which is a really interesting one. So the COI, not the ROI, uh, and help the client understand the impact of, of doing nothing or staying with their current situation. So any anything you'd add about you know why sales training is important here, Ken? Yeah, I, 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 the one thing I would add is that I think senior sales leadership is also realizing, like very much like many other uh, senior folks in organizations, uh, that the people they have currently filling the roles are definitely underskilled for the roles they're being expected to to perform. So I do think that across, you know, as we had this whole great employee turnover um, over the last few years, what we've done is we've taken people and stretched them and put them into stretch stretch opportunities. And I think we, as, as senior leaders inside, inside of companies, they're going back down and realizing that, hey, we've got to do something to get the skill level up. And so this, this is a, another, another reason why they're investing in people this way. Yeah, I think that's a really great call out. And you know, then as we see you know, potentially growing teams again, onboarding becomes more important. Uh, we know that training correlates strongly with retention. So we wanna keep those people that we have and keep them happy. Uh, so all all sorts of reasons why why training is important this year. So let's talk about what learners want uh, and and what kind of training methods uh, are going to be most effective for them. And so again, um, we'll we'll go to the audience here. And if you could, you know, make sure you're uh, responding to everyone in the chat. But I'd love to hear what modalities are you using for sales training. So within your organization, you know, what's uh, most likely or or the, your preference um, in terms of delivering sales training today. If you could go ahead and type in your chats here, we'd love to get a cross-section from the audience. And then Ken, we'll, uh, we'll share some of your research as well. And maybe just to help everybody, a modality is like the way it's delivered, right? So it could be like in person in a classroom, or it could be um, peer to peer, or it could be an e-learning or watch a video or read a PDF or, um, you know yeah. any any of those kinds of methods yeah no that that's a great call out uh, and good clarification and there are lots of different ways and uh i think we're seeing that you know it's hard to choose just one and that's why this is a chat and not a poll but uh <laughs> you know kate says sales enablement self-paced learning uh manager peer-to-peer -peer, 
Uh, Jenny brings up a really important point, and, and we're going to get to that. Instructor-led is back. Um, you bet. So Zoom Live, Zoom recorded, online learning courses, and as we'll see, you know, traditional instructor-led in the classroom has its place. Now, I'm not sure it's going to come back quite the same that, that it was pre-pandemic. I think we can use it more strategically. Um, but I was just in Australia uh, two weeks ago delivering uh, two workshops down there because a uh, client really wanted in person, and that was the best way to engage that group. Any, anything else you're seeing here, Ken? No, I, th I think they're I think they're hitting them all, um, which is great. It's good to see, um, as 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 one would expect on a call with you know uh, a large number of participants, everybody's going to have a different set of experiences, and that's really kind of why we did the research. We wanted to see. So sort of was there a match with what we're doing versus what learners prefer versus what they perceive to be effective? And uh, that's what we're going to talk through here. But, uh, you know, I'm seeing coaching. I'm seeing a lot of blending. I'm seeing, you know, instructor led with some virtual instructor led. So it's all of the, th the things we would expect to hear. Yeah, and I think blending in, you know, several shout outs for for kind of technology driven. Tom mentions, you know, self-paced video or small group video chat. Uh, Jerry like mentioned e-learning, e uh, TikTok style videos, instructional led, and peer to peer. So again, kind of a blended approach. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I, I also like to see the video role play. That's uh, that's becoming more and more common too. Yeah, and some interesting technology that's helping to enable and take that to the the next step as well. So. Yeah, lots of uh, good responses. Thanks everyone for participating. And let's let's talk a little bit then, uh, you know, about what the uh, what the larger scale research says. And so this was a question, you know, that I believe uh, you asked in the survey: How do learners want to learn? And listing a whole host of different options. Maybe you could talk us through. Uh, this slide and and kind of the high level findings, Ken. Sure. So 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 this is from uh, this was from our research that we did just pre COVID, um, and we're in the process of final uh, finishing the the post COVID version of this. Um, but as everyone probably expected, you want to have an instructor around. Um, you want somebody who who knows how to do it. And instructor led training usually usually dominates this kind of survey because. Um, you're looking for some kind of validation, especially if it has a role play involved in it. Uh, somebody can tell you you're doing the right things. Um, and and you like the classroom interaction usually that, that goes along with uh, uh, with, with uh, instructor led training. So that almost always wins. It is even winning. Uh, it was even winning during COVID. And we anticipate it will still win after COVID um, because it, I think there, there's a lot of perceived value in in uh, in in. Uh, in getting together. The other things that are interesting uh, are, are on the job training, um, although not quite as preferred to the degree as uh, instructor led. Um, the logic that explains why that one does so well always is because it makes the training most relevant. It brings it to, to the real problems that the learner's having at that point in time. So, so it's a way to practice sales with real accounts. So you're practicing your method with your real account. You're practicing the things you're learning in the course with your real accounts. Um, and the, the more real it can be, uh, the, the, the more likely you are to, to get some value out of it. Then the next one was e-learning at the time, yeah. virtual instructor-led training was not how learners wanted to learn. That did change uh, during COVID um, and the perception is much better after, but we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of effectiveness. But basically, how learners want to learn. They want to learn in uh, in a group setting uh, with an opportunity to practice. So uh, instructor-led lends itself best. Yeah, and I think it also brings up an important point that how they want to learn and what's possible is not necessarily exactly. always in alignment. And whether that's budget constraints, geographic constraints, uh, you know, during COVID, it just wasn't possible. And so I, I think we are seeing, you know, oh, there's an interest to get back together with with colleagues and, and practice those skills. Uh, so I think that that's important. The other thing I mentioned, as you mentioned, you know, kind of on the job or in the flow of work it is something that we strive hard to to do in any of our sessions, which is how do we apply that to real life accounts and real life situations in real time? So even though they may have a role play or a scenario they're working on, then having them immediately apply that and say, OK, now, you know, let's talk about your call plan for this coming up or what objections are you anticipating, et cetera. So 
I think it it really speaks to combining and we'll get to blended, but hey, if we can combine multiple channels, now uh, you know, we kind of hit the sweet spot. Yeah, it was interesting in this particular uh, uh, survey, um, the concept of blended learning hadn't been experienced by as many people as you might think. Um, so, so again, what was interesting is it scored quite low on here, uh, but all of the elements of blending, some practice, some instructor-led, and some e-learning all scored quite high. So, so it was just interesting to, to, to see how that, you know, before people had experiences they had during COVID that blended actually uh, fared not well on this slide. Yeah. No, and it's interesting. So if we think about how do they want to learn, and then the flip side of that is what do they think is most effective? And, and which delivery modalities are really helping them, right, improve their skills or what do they feel like they're getting the most out of? Can you speak to the findings here as well? Yeah. So, so the general findings are this, they don't think any of the ways of learning uh, are, are that poor. Um, and I think that's the, that's the first thing to take away is like the lowest score on here is like listening to a, a podcast as a, as a way of learning, you know, only, you know, only 45 percent of folks viewed it as a, effective. But if you take a look at the ones that that they really found effective, so on-the-job training, in-person instructor-led in a classroom, on-the-job coaching, practice with the context of real-world world simulations, um, so get really getting to try it, um, informal interaction with, with co-workers, coworkers. The theme of all of those is that they're, it's an interpersonal. There's a way they view the, the interaction with a person especially in sales training, to really drive their perception of effectiveness. They really believe that that is an important part of learning. And it doesn't have to be in person necessarily, because they still sit, think virtual instructor-led training, 60% of folks said, yeah, that's fine. That's very effective. Um, but but uh, I, you, you can see that the theme in there is, is the interaction with others. Yeah, no, important point. And Jeff brought up a question about coaching and it being, you know, kind of lower on the list. And I guess there are two parts of that on the job coaching. And then also, I think you talk about formal live coaching uh, as a lower. Is that lower than you would expect or or how do you account for that? No. So so they, we 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 split them because we thought it was there's an important difference there. The perception is if the coaching is real time on the job with you, it's more relevant than if you go to a, a coach who isn't in your work setting and then try and get them to understand your problems and then help you through them. So I think that's the, that's the, the difference uh, to make between the two. Yeah, I think that is a really good point. They don't value as much kind of the, the academic coaching as, and, and as what we talk about in our coaching program, let's go right along with them. Let's, let's have some specific coaching objectives. Let's make it pretty transparent what we're trying to focus on and where we want to improve. And then afterwards, let's have that, real-time coaching conversation about what went well and and where we might improve. So, yeah, I think that's a valuable distinction. And yes, the slides will be made available. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think people are valuing the data here. Um, and what we're learning, what we're learning more and more though, uh, uh, just to talk to the on the job training um, is that putting some kind of structure around that on the job training actually results in, in substantially higher effectiveness. So that doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean that it's it's completely sort of off script. It means that when we're getting together, we're going to work together on the job on on certain learning outcomes, and you can measure those, and you can talk about those ahead. You can prepare for those, and then you can make them happen uh, through on the job training. So I think it's really important to have structure around that. Yeah, I I think that can be helpful, and even if it's you know a simple playbook, uh, if it's some discussion questions. And the idea of having a, a coaching and training plan to say, well, you know, this quarter, let's focus on a couple of these things, not try to fix everything at once. Right. Um, but I think that does help make it more structured and more effective if we enable the manager, right, to be successful in doing that on the job coaching. Yeah, it's 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 I think we often forget that the most expensive part of training is the employee's time. Um, we often think of it, oh, you know, this training is going to be really expensive because I have to pay for the course. Well, the course is inconsequential in the context of the impact that training has on the employee. So when you take an employee sort of off the job, 
to go to a class or even interrupt their workflow to help them improve uh, their performance on certain things. That's the most important part of the exchange. And I think we often forget that. So structure is super important. Absolutely. And it and it's the cost of their time, you know, kind of per hour, as well as the opportunity cost. That yeah. means they're not on the phone. They're not in the field. They're they're not out training. And so it, it really has a multiplier effect. So we, we better make sure that time away is effective. And then we're supporting it and reinforcing it uh, going forward. Yeah, and uh, Jeff, on your comment on learning styles, I would maybe just tack a little bit away from learning styles and let, think more in terms of learning preferences. Like there may be just certain people who prefer to learn different ways. Um, and I think if you lean into their preferences, which is we're going to talk about a little bit more here, that's when you get the best outcomes, even on the job. Yeah, it's a, it's a good call out. And, and the truth is, yeah, people do learn differently, whether you're talking about styles or preferences. And we need to address that, right? We need to meet them where they are. Uh, I think you kind of summarized it here, but do you want to speak to that in terms of, you know, the takeaway? Yeah, just, you know, they, they want real applied opportunities to experience what they're learning and then practice it. I mean, you, you think of you think of the the true desire you have. If you're trying to learn a skill, you want to you want to understand what you're supposed to do, then you want to get a chance to practice. And I think uh, um, programs that are designed that way are perceived to be more effective. And generally are. Yeah, no, that's a great takeaway. So, well, let's keep moving here. Um, you know, the idea of, of meeting the learner, addressing that preferred style or, or learning preference uh, does have an impact on the outcomes as well and uh, addressing that. So can you talk to, or I guess my assumption is they do, um, <laughs> having talked to you about this before, but can you talk about, you know, why they matter and, and how that comes together? Yeah. So, so um, you know, again, what we were trying to get at is what makes people believe that the program that they're taking is better than another program that they took. And what we found was that if they had an experience in a modality that they preferred, so if I preferred to read books, if part of the learning journey was that I got a chance to read a book, then my perception of the overall program was that it was better. Um, so, so what that kind of, you know, we, we were coming at it sort of from the psychology of, of uh, heads of learning and development and heads of uh, sales enablement, sales training. Why would they be introducing more and more modalities? Because that's more and more expensive, right? Um, the reason is we think subconsciously their scores were going up um, when the learner had the ability to choose how they consumed some of the content. Um, so, so that's super important because every person that's involved in training of any uh, format uh, gets a lot of feedback about the training they provide. Um, so they want the feedback to be good. So, so, so it was very interesting to us to see that uh, just one experience in a preferred modality, uh, and we like the program better. Which was also really interesting in the context of this research is we found that Companies that deliver more effective, that when, I, when somebody, an employee experiences more effective training, so the better the training they, they experience, it gives them um, better work clarity, so they better understand what, the, what it is they have to do. It, they generally are more satisfied with their job. The, the job is, uh, if they've had really good training, the job becomes more central to their life. They, they, they feel a part of it. They, they, they feel more connected to it. Um, and they think their bosses are better. And if you think about that, if the reason they probably think their bosses are better is because they were shown how to do the task the right way. Um, and I think I think it's super important to see that there are other benefits beyond just just that they thought the program was good. When you do when we deliver effective training to employees, there are some outcomes that are quite significant, and that's why it's really becoming more and more thought of as a competitive advantage. The companies that have better training experience for their employees generally have more engaged employees and have a better retention story. Well, and, and when we're thinking about a business case for training, right, those are key drivers. If we can ramp people up quicker, if we can make them more effective, and if we can keep them yeah. <laughs> in times times of turnover, uh, we can quantify that and, and we can make some some projections on, on the value we're providing. So that's great. Um, so I'm going to beg the question here because I'm sure our audience, you know, it's made up of sales enablement and and learning and development professionals as well as sales professionals might be asking the question, well, wait a minute, you're making my job harder. Now I have to figure out how that learner wants to learn and I have to address that specific modality. And I've already got all these other things on the plate. 
And so, you know, let's talk about that. But how how do we do that? How do we hit them where they are or meet them with their learning preference? Yeah. So so this this is a this is a plot chart where we we tried to find the relationship between the number of modalities used in a learning journey. So we asked them uh, to to describe a learning journey that they've been on. So a learning journey would be like a course or a yep. series of courses, um, and we asked them how many modalities were in, involved in the, the course. So did you get a book? Did you get some PDFs? Was there a job aid? Did you do some e-learning? It's like, you know, stick count all of the, the modalities that you had. And then we asked them to tell us how effective it was. So a series of those three questions. So when we when we plotted the data, we saw a, a completely obvious relationship between the more the more modalities that they use, the, the higher they they the higher the perception was about the effectiveness of the training. So all that said, the the opportunity here for, for those folks who are responsible for sales training or training in general is it suggests that if we make them available, they will consume the ones that they want on their own journey. So so I think Ray, the the point around how do we how are we ever going to figure out what it is that they want, what modalities they want, I think the the answer to that is add the ones that make most sense to provide great training, but think broadly about how people might want to consume the content. So establish all of your learning outcomes and then think about which, what, what are some different ways that you could have an employee um, consume the content. So a um, perfect example might be take all of the uh, methodology uh, work uh, out, of, um, out of a sales training program and make that e-learning and then make the instructor-led session more about role play as an example. So that's taking advantage of having two modalities where you might have only did, done all of the instruction in the class. And then maybe have, uh, I, I thought the example was great, maybe you have a practice modality in there, which is using using a, uh, um, a video-based, Zoom-based, uh, you know, mm-hmm. practicing uh, role play. Um, so that's three you got. And then maybe there's a couple of job aids um, that, that are associated with the, the flow or the, the things you want them to remember when doing um, call prep. Um, so those job aids are other other are other modalities. So you, you're probably doing it um, uh, right now. But I think the 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 feedback from the uh, from the research was the more you can provide the the employee with different ways to consume or to understand the concepts in your learning, the more likely they are to view it as effective. And that's pretty important. I think that's really important. And, you know, I think blending those together and in a way that, you know, even like peer to peer, being intentional about how we connect them, how we have them collaborate. uh, And it's, I think, something we've seen grow as people are more virtual, but also they're engaging and maybe a little more comfortable doing that. You know, how do we create those moments where the light bulb goes on and they they start learning from each other uh, and they have those real life examples to share with each other? Yep. So yeah, that that's great, and n- I guess not surprising, but yeah, if we can uh, provide multiple ways for them to consume and practice, um, we're probably going to be more successful. So I think this was the the summary here, but maybe you could just uh, uh, speak to this. Yeah, just the preferences matter. I mean, we can't ignore them. You can't have one size fits all training these days anymore. Um, the employees expect better, and if this is a competitive weapon to to attract and retain retain. The best employees, their perception of how good the training is has a real impact on a lot of things other than what, just whether or not they learned it. Yeah, and I think Jerry brings up an interesting question about, you know, are we trying to deliver the same content through, you know, 10 different means, or are we using different modalities across different pieces of learning? And at least in our experience, I, I think the idea, as you mentioned, is, well, let's take the lecture base and if we can do that through micro learning or pre-work and flip the classroom, that's a great use of time and resources and we can track completion, but let's do the role play, let's do the collaboration, let's do the discussion live where you really need somebody to facilitate that uh, in a setting. Would, would you agree, anything to add to that? Yeah, the only thing I would add is, um, I, I would say the best in class programs actually provide multiple routes to, to the same learning outcome. So, so there are situations where one employee might want the flipped classroom version of it, but another employee might want the instructor-led version of it. 
So don't, I don't think it's a one size fits all that, yeah, let's flip the classroom and have the, the, uh, the, the classroom session be interactive and practicey, and then not have a, a, a another form of practice. I, I think, I think when it comes to the actual learning outcomes, making uh, available different ways for them to accomplish those outcomes is a positive thing. Expensive, but has it, but, but has a really positive right. impact. Right. Uh, but remember, remember that's not the expensive part. The expensive part is the employee who goes through the training has a, has a bad perception of its quality and leaves the company because. Of it. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, and and that cost is is yeah. much more significant. <laughs> yeah, it's much more than having e learning and instructor led. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So you know, having said all of that as a backdrop, love to hear from our audience again. You know, what what do their participants prefer? And I think, you know, it may beg the question, well, do we know <laughs> or have we asked them? But I guess just a sample, we talked about what we're using previously, but I'd love to hear from our audience. We have cross industry, cross cross geography across the globe. Um, you know, what what are learning? What are the learners telling you about how they want to learn these days? So if you could chat that in, we'll give people a, a second. Role playing. Mm-hmm. Small groups, I like that. Recurring webinars, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. I, I think everybody would agree that, well, not everybody. I, their instructor-led tends to win no matter how we ask the question. Um, and, and in-person tends to win usually, even over virtual. Mm -hmm. But, but it, I, I think it's coming. I think virtual, uh, it's improving and people are starting to prefer yeah. it more. Well, you know, and, and several people brought up VILT, and and I think we have seen a trend, and we were chatting about that just before the session, about, you know, we're seeing people are more comfortable in a virtual environment. I think, in general, trainers have gotten better about engaging a virtual audience. And one of the things we've seen is, I mean, you don't have to explain a breakout room anymore. Right. You don't have to get them to turn their cameras on, typically. I mean, maybe still encourage them, but they know how to do it. Uh, and so... I think they're better at consuming VILT. Would would you agree with that? Yeah, it's almost like there's 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 more of a accepted set of norms. Um, we, we at the training industry we have a certification program called the Certification um, for, for Training Managers. Basically, uh, um, we we help them become professionals in training management, and um, we've always done that program as virtual instructor led. Um, and it was because the nature of the program was a, a heavy bunch of e-learning to kind of get through all the concepts. And then it just made sense for us to have sort of a, a you know, four virtual days um, where people would come together and go back through the concepts. Um, and, and, and we also found that it was much easier to, to keep classrooms full or at the right size because people could come in from a variety of locations and made it really simple. But we designed the program for that environment. Um, and I think that's that's what we've learned over the over the last couple of years is if you you have to design the program to operate in that environment. I think that's really important. Um, and th there were two comments both from Rob and Russ about simulation. And and I don't I don't think that was asked specifically, but you know I think in some ways that could be role playing or that could be a case study role play type situation or it could be more you know automated or or technology driven is that something you're seeing evolving as well yeah we, we are seeing um we are seeing simulation as practice becoming more and more common um with the real uh or i'm going to get the word wrong but the, the the ai using real language uh you're you're also able to to score interactions um um, against a rubric, uh, which is becoming super helpful too in in sales training domains and uh, other sort of interactive or interpersonal skill development areas. Yeah, and that's probably a topic for a whole nother webinar. But yeah. you know, the the idea of using an AI chatbot that you can uh, practice your role play and get immediate feedback. Um, you know, I think it has a ways to go, but I think there's some really interesting technology coming out along those yep. lines. Yeah, we're starting to we're starting to see them, and they're pretty good. I mean, they, you know, when you when you when you can build a rubric that that includes, you know, did you mention all the appropriate things about the product? How many times? And you know, and it's and it's it's watching for how many times you asked a question versus gave an answer. 
just 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 some of the the basics that uh, that often get over uh, overlooked. Um, uh, you know, when you're practicing by yourself, I think it's it's uh, it's cool. It's also neat to I, I'm I I had a demonstration for for a technology that will review a call video. So if you did a Zoom sales call, you can then have it scored by the virtual coach, and it'll tell you uh, some areas for improvement. So I think those are going to be really cool tools as they become more mainstream. Yeah. And again, I think we would argue they enable the frontline manager to be more successful and and scale. Um, they allow the, the rep to maybe get additional coaching, does not replace the frontline manager in any way. And in fact, it's still the nuance of, hey, let's review a couple of these and have a discussion about what's going to be most effective and, and how we put that into practice, right? Yeah, the interesting thing about it is, is there's this perception again that it it creates a psychologically safe way for the employee to get feedback on their performance without actually, you know, so they could be practicing even when their boss isn't watching or the first line manager isn't watching. Um, so it gives them another way to to improve skills in a way that may feel safe. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. Even on a submission of a video, if we say, hey, you know, submit. A video handling an objection or submit a, a short video on your value proposition. Uh, the learners are going to practice that multiple times, typically before they submit it. And so we're getting repetition and we're getting learning just by the fact that they don't want to put you know garbage up there. Exactly. And now they've had to practice before they submit it, especially in in the collaborative environment. Before they submit it to their peers, they want to make sure they've they've done a pretty good job with it. Yeah, I've seen organizations also make the scores of those practice sessions public, so that that gets that gets super competitive. So people will re re-record it until it's perfect, you know. Yeah, well, we'll talk a little bit about gamification uh, as well in some of the examples, and I just wanted to walk through, you know, a, a couple that we've seen uh, how we've implemented some of these concepts, and maybe have you comment as well on, um, you know, how it refers back to to some of the preferences. Um, but I'll share, you know, one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is migrate all of our programs to what we call a collaborative learning experience. So a CLX environment. Uh, we use Intrepid, but there are many, you know, great, great platforms out there. Um, so you can think of it as an online university type uh, medium where we're exposing the content, the videos, each of these blue bars expands. So there's different concepts in there. Uh, and then they're able to complete a mission or an activity. So that's where they might submit their coaching plan or they might do a, an assessment. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, the fact that peers can see each other's work and we have prompts for them to comment and give each other feedback, it really opens up a, a collaborative kind of social aspect to the learning and then when we have live uh, discussions and, and coaching sessions, we're able to curate and bring some of those in and say, hey, let, you know, let's talk about this specific example uh, and, and bring those to life that way. So, I mean, I know you're familiar with the the, the concept and the platform, but anything anything you would add to this? Um, no, I would just maybe I mean, I think I think, again, leveraging leveraging all of the best parts of, of that platform by, uh, by far. Uh, the one thing I would just add kind of more broadly around this the concept of coaching, one of the trends that we're seeing more and more in the marketplace is this concept of metered coaching, um, whereby uh, you're learning your, your training provider or even internal coaches inside of organizations are now being able to, to offer sort of micro coaching sessions that are metered or counted um, so that uh, um, employees get access to coaching when they need the coaching on the job at the point of need. Um, so th this this concept of of being able to to almost like uh, uh, to track it like in terms of distance, <laughs> like how 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 much of the coaching did you use, um, and and uh, and being able to make that a variable cost to the organization also is is becoming more and more interesting with the ability for somebody to coach over Zoom. No, I think that's really exciting. You got some thumbs up on that. Uh, I think it resonated. Uh, and I think we're seeing that. I think the other exciting thing, if we're doing technology and leveraging some of the platforms, is now we can see who's getting coaching and how is it correlated with effectiveness. So if we can say, hey, this manager tends to do 30% more coaching and their team is outperforming everyone else, okay, how do we replicate that, <laughs> right? What do we need to do? And vice versa, if somebody isn't coaching and they're underperforming, we, we probably have a gap we need to address there. 
There's also some really cool data that comes out of it too. If you take that sort of meter coaching mindset and put it into the whole organization, um, it can be super helpful for the manager to know where where ultimately they're spending time. Hmm. Um, so there's there's a there's a whole lot of additional value uh, that that comes out of thinking about your coaching structure as one that you can meter. I think that's important. I think when you ask managers if they coach, they'll say, "Well, absolutely." <laughs> If they start, if you start looking at calendars and and job task analysis, what they think they're coaching is maybe a quick phone call or telling somebody to do something. Uh, it's not certainly structured coaching time. And in right. fact, even time with clients, they're not spending nearly as much as we might think they are. Right. Um, and it begs the question. Unfortunately, we've loaded them up with reports and meetings and internal and all these other things. But yeah, thinking about that cadence of the sales manager. Uh, and what's the most effective use, I think, is a really interesting discussion for maybe another time. Yep. Um, so I, I just wanted to share, you mentioned learning journeys and this idea of kind of a multimodal and uh, an, an ongoing uh, program. So this is our high impact sales manager program. Uh, this is an example that we delivered uh, for a large uh, manufacturer. It was actually for their dealer network. Uh, and we're taking 50 to 100 people through the program per cohort. Uh, but this idea of multimodal, so um, they get access in the platform to the materials, uh, as you saw kind of previously, uh, the videos, the, the self-paced learning, the activities, and then these ARC sessions, as we call them, application review and coaching, are a chance to catch up. Catch up. That's the office hour. That's the chance to showcase the work that's being done. And so it's a, a kind of a dripped mode where we're releasing a module typically every week, but you know sometimes there's a gap and going through, in this case, managing performance and then managing the pipeline and then our sales coaching program into sales leadership. Uh, and in this case, re recruiting and selecting is last. And this is very modular. So we often mix and match or, or flip the, uh, the schedule around. But I just want to point that out because this, this is using you know, both the e-learning, e it's using ILT or VILT in this case, and coaching. Uh, and it's also using that opportunity to collaborate with peers in, in those sessions. So we're hitting on a number of those top modalities that you mentioned. Yeah. And I think it, I think this structure, again, for those that are going to be building programs, this, this structure is kind of what we're seeing more and more of. And like I said, as somebody who goes through the journey, they're actually going to have experiences in the way they want to experience the content. And that's really the key to, to them doing it as, as effectively. Great, well, we said we'd share a couple of stories. I just have one other to, to share. Uh, and this is an example, again, delivered in the same modality. This is for a selling skills program or comprehensive selling skills. Uh, and so also delivered in a, in a digital blended environment with, with the live coaching sessions. And one of the things we've done, because people always ask, well, how do you know at the end of the program it's, if it's successful, right? You haven't had time to measure sales results, but we've started capturing this confidence shift. And one of the things the platform allows us to do is take a snapshot at the very first activity. Hey, how confident are you today executing these skills? And we define what we mean by these key areas, which probably everybody look at and go, yeah, that seems like reasonable selling skills to, to master. Uh, so how confident are you on day one? And then whether it's six, seven weeks later, how confident are you having gone through the program and the activities? And it's really quite remarkable, just increasing the visibility, increasing the opportunity to, to share and practice, uh, and then coming out of the program, you know, what's their confidence? And overall, this was about a 30%, 33% shift in confidence. This was for a large tech client where they were taking technical specialists and they wanted to encourage them to be more consultative. So consultative salespeople and, you know, they're technical experts. And in fact, some thought sales was a dirty word, right? So how do we take them from you're really great at the technology and your expertise, but also open them up to building relationships and having that consultative conversation? Uh, so this is, I just wanted to share was an example of, you know, kind of real life outcomes from a very large. In this case, we had about 60 people going through uh, per cohort, and we got a really nice confidence shift. Any, any yeah, comments on this, Ken? Yeah, I just I just want to make the point that I think for those who are designing programs um, themselves, this is a real easy metric of before and after to put in place around your programs where you can demonstrate impact. So it's super hard to to measure the fact that your training resulted in them performing better, even though 
you can sometimes make connections, but there are many, many variables involved with that, uh, getting to that performance. Um, this is a clear, you know, we had people that came into the session, they didn't think they were very good at qualifying, they left the session, they felt they were very good with qualifying. And what I, what I see added to this as the last layer is then uh, you, we asked the manager to do a ride along and then do the same evaluation across the same spectrum. And that gives you sort of your three data points that says, here's the impact. Of Absolutely. And I think it's so important to get the managers involved, make sure they have the coaching skills and the, the coaching resources. So whether that's a playbook or a checklist and then ongoing, because the training is going to be long gone. But if the managers haven't embraced it and aren't pulling it forward, you know, we're likely not going to get the behavior change that, that we're looking for. Yep. So let's just summarize here. We'll take a, a few more questions if there are and uh, and let people get on with their days. But, you know, I, I think we covered a lot of ground here um, talking about uh, how learners want to, to learn um, the applied experiential practice uh, being very successful and that the preferred training method does impact uh, the effectiveness and, you know, on the job and kind of that real life application and coaching we're some of the preferred ways that salespeople want to, to learn. Not that they don't still need the e-learning or the lecture uh, to go along with that, but, you know, let's, let's hit them where they are. And then, you know, blended, whatever that looks like for your organization, but some combination of blended not only has become the norm, but is more likely to hit on one of the modalities that's going to be uh, most successful for them. Anything you'd add to this, Ken? No, I, I think, I think we talked about a lot of things, but at, at its heart, um, you know, I really think that programs designed to take into consideration the learner and what the learner prefers uh, will really be, you know, far better received than those that don't. Um, and I, again, remember that you're having a much bigger impact on them and their perception of training has a much bigger, better, bigger impact on them than merely uh, teaching them a skill. It's, it's, it impacts other elements of their work experience. I think it's important to remember that.